Hi, everyone. Um, happy Tuesday, and thank you for joining us again. Um, my name is Lillian Corral, and welcome to Coast to Coast. Um, I'm joined by my colleague, Lily Weinberg. How are you, Lily? Hi. How's I'm it going well. in Miami? It's going well. How are you, Lillian? I'm good. We're um, in Los Angeles, just watching our world un un unfold and, and seeing a lot of like really interesting stuff happen across our community in particular around um, questions of, um, I think in particular this week, really talking about this question of um, defunding the police and what does that really look like? Yeah. Um, I don't know what you're hearing in Miami and, and how the conversation is going yeah. over there. I think that's what's been really important right now is now, um, you know, it's moving into action and, and many cities across the country. And so, so yes, um, you know, definitely a conversation around um, budgets and, and how to think about equity around the budgets, whether that's around police and, and other, um, other yeah. areas. Um, and, um, and then I also um, think um, more broadly, um, I had a few communities, interesting enough, reach out to me after our last episode with St. Paul to ask, what is a chief equity officer? How can we potentially bring that to our to our community, especially for some of the small to mid-sized markets that, that, that don't have that? So I thought that was really interesting to see. You know, cities are thinking about this. They're really thinking about how do we address um, systemic racism? So um, that's right. Yeah. And that's, that's great. And so, Lily, why don't you tell our guests um, who've joined us a little bit about Coast to Coast and why we talk about these issues sure. um, every week? Sure, sure. So for Coast to Coast, we are looking at the future of cities, um, especially for building communities um, in a time of rapid change that we're experiencing right now. Um, we started by doing a deep dive around public space. We looked at streets, we looked at the public realm, um, and, and we're going to continue to move into relevant topics um, related to engaged communities, um, such as mobility and technology. Um, equity and inclusion um, has been at the heart of what we've been talking about in every single episode last last week we did a deep dive um, and um, and lastly um, we we've made a commitment um, between you and me and and for our audience that we want them to leave with with actionable tangible ideas that they can bring back to their community that's right and so today um, our episode is titled uh, placemaking for justice and it's really was inspired by what you and I saw um, and our colleagues um, in our communities program here at Knight Foundation we were engaged in a discussion about what, what was happening in DC um, around Black Lives Matter Plaza and the the art that was being developed around it on the street and then we were seeing it pop up in cities like Charlotte and Detroit and so we thought well what a better time than now to talk about place making and what does that look like and so we have two really great leaders joining us to think through this issue of how communities across the country are responding to the ongoing conversation around race and equity in different ways in public spaces and through cultural and arts um, as a medium culture and arts as a medium so um, i'm excited to welcome our first guest um who is taiwo yayoba who is the assistant city manager and director of planning design and development for the city of charlotte um, and then our second guest today is sydney james um, a detroit-based muralist whose work around public art has really focused on centering black women in communities and in particularly thinking about how we position the black woman in america as the last or least among others in society and bringing up that theme up. So Taiwo and Sydney, um, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. So, hi there. How are you? Very good. How are you? How are you both doing today? You know, right. Oh, you know, exhausted like everybody is. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a lot of work happening and you both are at the center of it in your cities, um, which is really exciting for us to talk about. So, um, so I, I want to start by saying, so today we really wanted to explore explore the, the power of place and, and how the arts, culture, creativity can really, um, in, in a lot of ways, drive that broader agenda of change that communities are really um, are really asking for and mobilizing around like we've never we haven't seen in, in decades, frankly. Um, so um, first, it'd be great to just start by some context. And so maybe what I would ask is for both of you to start by sharing a little bit about yourself, but also just telling us what are you seeing in your respective cities, Sydney, you in Detroit, Taiwo, you in Charlotte. So I don't know who wants to start, but. It's Sydney, go. 
Okay. <laughs> um, my name is Sidney G. James. I'm Detroit bred, a fine artist slash muralist. Um, I, I've only been, I'm a lifelong artist, but I've been painting murals for about five years now. And one of the first murals I painted um, was for the Murals in the Market uh, Festival, but it was, it stemmed, the idea behind it, like stemmed from police violence against women, uh, as well as men, but so it was a, a black woman holding a protest sign saying that there's literally nothing that, that can play, protect black people in this country. So that's kind of, that was where I got my art activism. It kind of, it was, it started like in 2016. Well, uh, <laughs> nice to meet you, Sydney. My name is Taiwo Jayoba. I'm the planning director for the city of Charlotte, but I'm also assistant city manager. I truly believe that um, people are the ones who make cities matter. And if people make cities matter, then cities should make people matter. And when there are people in the city who are feeling that they don't matter at all, we should use every available resource like painting murals, you know, just creating an environment, spaces for people to be able to be themselves. To Cities should do that uh, to make sure that every voice um, matters to the environment and to the discussions of placemaking. And they are safe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yes. yes, and feel safe in the spaces. That's great. So I'm going to start by asking you both a couple of questions um, to get the conversation started, but I'm encouraging everyone online watching us to please share their questions in the Q&A. If you're on Facebook, um, please also uh, note that we're tracking those questions, or if you're on Twitter, um, please use the hashtag night live, and we'll answer, we'll be taking up your questions and answering and answering those and addressing them. Um, so we're seeing protests across the nation obviously spread and art has really become public art is sort of really taking hold within those activities so from your individual perspective Taiwo from the city Sydney as an artist um, can you talk first Taiwo about how place can address race and equity in our communities I mean you started to kind of talk about it in your intro but what do you think what do you th from a planning perspective what is the what is the importance of place in really helping cities address race and equity and how can we how can we think about it on a practical level it's an opportunity to bring people together so for, first of all when i saw what mayor bowser did in dc with the black lives matter uh, and plaza the planner in me just thought how do we do this in a way in charlotte and use it as a way to bring artists together but also make sure that it's an um, urban main street where usually black and brown people do not come. It's only the corporations that come there because they're mostly white people. How can we turn this black life mural instead of it just being political into an inspiration for individuals? So we engaged artists who came in and we paid each artist, uh, you know, a letter of the, um, of the, of the word from uh, you know, be all the way to R, pay them $500, ask them to use their creativity to express their vision. And so it was a way to bring people together. Occupying that space between place and race is so important. Uh, and art occupies a valuable part of that space. So that's what we did. That's, that's great. And I think um, this question of of, of bringing people together is an important one because um, the community is engaging in a lot of different ways right now because of the urgency of the moment. But I think, you know, just sort of thinking more long term, maybe I'll just follow this question up with you, Taiwo. Like, how do we keep that momentum going? Because sometimes places are not engaging, are, they're not designed to be engaging for people. So, can you talk a little bit more about the long term vision that you and the city of Charlotte have been developing to make sure that, I mean, um, is there a vision? And, and I'm assuming, and um, and just just from what I know about you, and so um, and, and how do we make sure that we continue to in, to have a place really matter for the people that um, that circulate that space, that live around it, that work in it. So all this work from the vision pay, uh, phase to the time it was installed took about five days. Um, normally it would take months to happen. 
uh, but you know, it definitely showed that there was momentum. That this is not just a moment, but a movement, right? And so the first thing we did right over was to close that section of the street. Um, the hard work itself is permanent until the time happens in the future when we resurface that street. But one way by which we can actually create this in a permanent way is close that. But can we also close other segments of the street? Um, maybe not just temporarily, but going forward, we're having conversations around that right now. And I would like to also start this annual arts festival, muralist, painting, you know, street. Um, can, can we do that? Uh, and, and, you know, not just around this, but this has really galvanized. You see in that picture, you see all those boards on those yes. buildings? Those are different now. The spin-off from this is that muralists and artists have gone there and started painting on them, and you know, all kinds of beautiful artwork. So the vision is to expand from what we've started into something that could be great. We have about $160,000 in our budget for placemaking, and out of that, we dedicate about half of it to, uh, to artists. Uh, we awarded about 18 different grants this past year. Uh, to artists that they can go and paint different uh, different areas in our city. And we're beginning to see a lot of that. And I, hopefully I can, with this, I can actually increase that amount of money. That's, and get that's amazing. Money. That's yeah. amazing. I'd love to talk a little later more about how you as a city are creating that space for that. Um, Sydney, can you tell us a little bit more about how you see the other side of this equation, which is the art, the artist side. Um, how are artists activating and joining the protest efforts? Talk a little. I mean, share with us a little bit about your um, your fourteen day turnaround um, in Detroit around your own mural and work. But how are you also seeing the rest of artists, whether in Detroit or or in other cities, really respond to this moment? Well, Nina Simone, James Baldwin. And Harry Belafonte and I'm sure others from the past have always said it's the artist's duty to reflect the times, mm -hmm. right? It's our responsibility and our burden to tell our truths. Um, so with my particular project um, that I took on, that I created and completed um, with the team, with the help of the community, it was um, a big, a very large mural of Malice Green that I wanted to paint. Miles Green was murdered here in Detroit in 1992. Um, the, and after he, by the po at the hands of police, they literally beat this man to death in his own neighborhood. So back then, um, Benny White Jr. painted a small mural in Malice Green's community of Malice. And Malice was a handsome man, and he, and he, he kind of resembled what we probably would paint a black Jesus to look like. So in the original painting, Benny White Jr. like uh, painted black tears streaming from Malice's eyes. Um, so after George Floyd was murdered, an article came out about the Malice Green case because what was special about his case is Kim Worthy actually got a conviction. It wasn't the conviction that we deserve, but it was still a conviction. Whereas we see right now, even currently, even getting officers who commit murders arrested it's still a is 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 a is a hard feat. So Miles Green for the city of Detroit and really this nation, that was a symbol that we won a little bit of justice in these this multitude of injustices. So I read in an article the day after George Floyd got murdered that the original Miles Green mural was destroyed. It was demolished. It was on the party store and against the community's will, they demolished the painting too. Like they literally could have preserved this painting. And it put me in motion. Like I hadn't been doing anything because of COVID because my family has been doing, dealing a lot with it and I haven't been inspired, but this was something I felt compelled to do. So I engaged the community by literally just posting a sketch of what I wanted to do. And it's a malice green mural, but I painted him as he was a statue and he's holding a scroll. And the scroll contains a lot of names of people who have died at the hands of police. Now, interestingly enough, it's not interesting, it's actually horrible. Um, my initial goal with the scroll was to list every name of people who have died at the hand of injustice in this country since my date of birth, July 6, 1979. It was an impossible feat because just 2014, 2015, it's mm -hmm. over a thousand names. 
Like, and just think about it. Every it's clearly not a thousand headlines. These are names that people most people have forgotten or didn't even know exist. So um, I took this on. I put up a GoFundMe the second day after I put um, I put the sketch out, and I needed the GoFundMe because the wall is just so large. It's thirty five hundred square feet, and that takes equipment. That takes boom lifts, a lot of paint, and it took a team. Now. I did not get paid for this mural. I am not taking any of the money. Um, I put up a GoFundMe for 10000 I reached my goal in two and a half hours. I exceeded my goal by 8000 by the following day. I shut off donations because I exceeded what I needed. I needed a little bit more than what I asked for, so I was good to have the overages, but everything else that I don't use will be do donated to the, back, the Black Youth Power uh, Power 100 group, and those donations um, directly feed into the legal fees of protesters, Detroit resident protesters that were arrested during the protests unjustly. So, yeah. yeah, that's how I involve the community because these names are our names. We are all bound. And yeah. whether you white, black, whatever, like when you see this wall, I painted it beautifully, yes, but it's extremely oxymoronic aesthetically it's gorgeous you know and i'm not tooting my own horn my team worked very hard to get it to look exactly how i yeah. wanted it but at the heart of everything at the heart at, at its core it's a very very ugly piece it's, it's a ugly. very yeah yeah and so taiwo from the city perspective you know we're constantly hearing i'm hearing these threads about like we you know the community we've been having these conversations for a long time we've been saying these there are way too many names to to, to list on a wall. Um, can you talk a little bit about, it sounds like you're trying to create concrete ways to support this dialogue, at least through this through this avenue of placemaking. Can you talk a little bit more about like what specifically you're doing so that other cities, we, we, we get a lot of city practitioners on our, on our guests, um, on our audience. And so like, what can they be doing? And then the other thing too is, can you also just share a little bit about like, what are the challenges you face? You know, this is a, this is an ugly and tough conversation as Sydney just alluded to. And so like, what are the challenges that you face and how are you addressing them more specifically um, through some of the things that you're working on? So the, the, we've had the same things that you all have had, whether it's in Detroit or it's in LA or it's in Miami or wherever you are, things related to um, equity, policing, uh, systemic racism. Now the knee jerk reaction, in my opinion, is for corporations to say, you know what, the way to address this is by promoting a few black people and put them into executive positions, management that. As far as I'm concerned, that's not enough. That's just exactly. like a window dressing. You've got to really be forceful about this and be deliberate about this. Go into these communities and put your money where your mouth is. If you're really truly going to make a difference, I don't want to be hearing that we did this economic analysis and it tells us that there's not enough income on that side of town to support our business make it work revise right. your economic model as government entity i am committed to taking a good look at our policies that have systemically segregated us in this city in charlotte we refer to a wedge and we refer to a crescent the wedge is where most white people live it's also the most affluent place also where you have the full service grocery stores the full service banks is where you have the quickest responses to fire incidents the crescent, on the other hand, is where we have our black and brown communities live. That's where you have the poorest quality of schools. That's where real estate people don't take you when you're moving into town deliberately. How can we go into these communities and begin to change the narratives? We're not saying that because of crime, we won't go there to invest. No, let's invest because of crime okay. so that we can infect, we can affect that. That's my job as planning director. How can we invest in mobility? to create equity how can we make sure that you know we do things differently yes we, I'm, I'm gonna have challenges I will tell you now that this heart was installed on Tuesday since then I've been fending off a lot of racist emails phone calls you know uh, people wanting to also paint white lives matter you know uh, on the prominent city street that's not the way we build an equitable city 
is by paying attention to those who have been undervalued, the least among us, and begin to make sure that we also uplift them to a point where we can say we live in a society that's equitable. But also our next budget, we're investing in six corridors, about $24 million. And these six corridors are in our poorest areas in the Crescent, like I said. The goal is not to do a study. The goal is to have projects. And that involves people like Sydney, who can actually help us make these things come alive. So it's not just building sidewalks, but how do they become vibrant places for people to gather and to do life? Great. So I'm going to bring Lily on. Who, we're getting a flood of questions, but it definitely seems like run towards these issues. Don't stay away from communities and then really invest and do work, do the projects. Um, thank you all. Lily, what are you hearing on the Q&A? Yeah, no, this is this is a great conversation. Um, and, and there's a couple of questions that that um, are are trying to get to um, understand how um, the arts and and cultural um, can really um, address some of the the, the very serious um, systemic racism that we have in our communities. Um, one one um, participant asked, you know, how does this lead to economic justice? How does you know how do we how do we take the the next step? So um, it, it's an important question. Um, Taiwo, you wanna you wanna start? As how to take the next step from here. So one of the things that we started to do, and I think it can address one of the questions as well with regards to slow down in vehicles. One of the first things we did with during COVID was to shut down certain streets to through traffic. But we not only did that, we also engaged artists to paint the intersections of these streets. So there's a combination of shared streets protecting pedestrians and bicyclists but also installing hearts creating visually aesthetic streets by also slowing down vehicles and then the next thing is really let's bring down you know the restaurants to our outdoor dining i'll tell you this we had a meeting with some of our restaurants yesterday where this uh, mural is a uh, mccormick and schmicks the guys said to us that they had their best Saturday, their best weekend in months since the shutdown. Because we painted Black Lives Matter right at that location, they had their best. And they said to me, can we keep this going? If we keep this going, I will bring more of my employees back. That's the power of heart in the public yes, it is. Realm. It is a power of heart in the public realm. It becomes a gathering place that people can actually combine business and, and life at the center. So that's what we plan to do going forward from this point. Mm. Yeah, because art, like artists, we just want to create, right? We just want to create the space. But the community, especially if it's not ugly, like loves it. Whereas like the people in the communities, they see the art, but developers, they see opportunity. Mm -hmm. So they have to start seeing opportunity, but not pushing out the community. So we need, it's, it's like, we need like to come together instead of like a developers coming into the spaces where we have created art and then outpricing the citizens that were already residing in those spaces. Mm -hmm. It's like such a big conversation yeah. and it's actually the beginning of a hundred conversations. Yeah. But I am grateful that we're starting to have them. But also with the city beautification, I really appreciate Taiwo because he even pointed out, we this is our budget. Half of that budget went to pay artists. That's not what city, like cities like to give artists stipends. They don't like to pay us for our work. Mm. Like honestly, had that been a city project that I did, like I would have maybe profited a thousand bucks, possibly off of a 3,500 square foot wall. And that's just, that's not real. That's not artist pricing. That's not anybody's pricing. It takes more to prime that wall than what the city be offering, like these community projects. So that's also part of these hundreds of thousands of conversations that need to be had. It's like, you know, properly pay somebody. Art is a job. There are no. thousands of art jobs. Yeah. And we deserve it. It's not a hobby. We deserve to be paid because this is our life livelihood. Like we do it because we love it and we're going to do it regardless. However, if you want me to do it for you, you want to pay. Yeah. And that should be, I don't know, that should just be common sense, but it's not. 
And Sydney, um, your point um, about about artists and getting paid is actually one of the questions that we had um, in the in the queue of questions. So um, so important and 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 certainly noted. Um, and I think the the bigger picture though is that is that these these murals, the the artwork is really bringing people together in our communities. It's bringing right. conversations. I mean, it's it's been extraordinary to see the pictures of of how community have come together. Um, and um, and and then the next steps are um, hopefully around policy. Um, so so to that point, Sydney, I'm going to um, continue this thread a little bit. Um, there's a question around how can we foster um, a tradition um, around cultural organizing? You know, how can this how can this become a tradition? Um, Put art back in schools. Put art and music back in schools where you have art field trips. And kids know that art is for them because when you take art out of schools and then you take out these field trips to the museums and stuff, now the kids, okay, the target is in this neighborhood. We don't have a target in Detroit, the city of Detroit. Not, we, you know what I'm saying? We don't have major, just like he was pointing out, like, oh, no, the full service grocery store is there over here in these areas. It's the same thing in Detroit. Detroit is 137 square miles, and we don't have even a target. You know what I mean? So when you take all of these things out of the city and you don't have things in the city or in the schools, you really believe subconsciously, oh, this don't belong to me. It's for others. For some reason, I'm not deserving of this. So at the the basic answer to that question is literally put art back in schools. Mm-hmm. Like, because the seed has to be planted early. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. that's how you grow the seed. That's how you flourish. Mm-hmm. That's how you have a harvest. Like, cause you see, it's not just work that looks like work. Work doesn't always have to look like work. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, and I think like it starts with education and then yeah. education also educates adults too. Like yeah. it doesn't just stop when you're at school, you get educated every day. And I think that's also the importance of this particular mural that I just did, because it's one thing for you to see this post, this post, this post, this headline, they're mm-hmm. still just singular. It's a whole nother thing. If you literally look at this big, this big old wall, I was about to say, mm-hmm. this, um, and you see all of these names and you're overwhelmed by all of these names and right. don't Google one. Cause if you Google one, you're going to really find out the evil that's been done to our people. Mm. Most of the names like on, on one side of the wall, there, most of the victims were under 18. Wow. Wow. Um, for, for our audience members, um, we linked um, for more information on the murals. Um, and, and so, so please um, read more. It's really, really important. Um, and thanks for, for um, highlighting the piece about, about the education for the arts. Um, I'm going to pivot a little bit um, because we are running out of time. This, this goes by very fast. Um, it does. <laughs> Taiwo, um, we have a series of questions um, around, you know, how, how do, how do you do this? Like how, how does, how does a city, how do you get buy-in from the city to to do this um, one and then the second piece is is a component around um, businesses you know you you did this in a business corridor um, and and how do you also get buy-in um, from businesses so I'll say leadership very critical uh, it's also very important that you're not afraid I'm a black dude who happens to be a planning director and as an assistant city manager it's easy for me to say I will sit here I won't do anything so that I'm not labeled as being just a black guy trying to champion the cause of my people. That's not the point. The point is that I am in this position to lead what's best for our city. How that happens is by listening to the community, by listening to council members. A lot of ideas are not new. It just takes boldness to implement them. And so I've heard what the council members have been saying about Triumph for the longest time. That's the corridor where we have museum, we have an art gallery. And so it just makes sense to do something along that corridor. But it also about not being um, you know, afraid. I, and I think that that's very important because you have a vision and you got to be willing to, to go all out for it. And that we, we, convey, we met with the businesses. We met with them now three times, the most recent thing yesterday. And we have another meeting coming next week with businesses, with uh, fire department, police, if we're talking about closure of this corridor, how does it impact you? Uh, we're doing our own analysis. And so you've got to do all these things. So while you're doing your own internal work with your you know, executive leadership, 
you got to make sure that you're carrying your council along. Um, and also, this placemaking grant was approved by council a year ago. Uh, we're coming to the end of our fiscal year. We've got leftover budget, and we just said, let's use that. But we've got another money coming from July. And so I know a lot of people are listening to me and, you know, artists, welcome to submit. And uh, we definitely welcome you to, to do great work uh, in our city. So it's really about collectivity and uh, collaboration. Fantastic. You have, you have a vision to continue this um, in Charlotte. That's really exciting um, and important. Um, we, there's a lot more questions, but but unfortunately we can't we can't get to them. Um, and um, but I want to yes. Hey, Lillian. Um, Lillian will will close us out. Yeah, no, that's, it's a fabulous conversation and 30 minutes goes by fast. We do have a ton of questions left in the queue. Um, but I think what we'll do is let's just turn it over to you for like one last big reflection. I mean, Taiwo, you just talked about leadership. Um, so maybe Sydney, you can kick us off with like, what's the one thing you would tell to folks in the audience who are a mix of, it, it sounds like a mix of artists, city practitioners, planners, um, to futurists, um, wh what's the one thing to keep this kind of work alive and going um, that you think is critical? We can't forget, like right now we're living in an interesting time because for once since 1619, the world has space and time because of COVID. So we, the, the world has time to look and actually see what's been going on. So that's why we have all this attention. We can't forget though, as soon as we get our, you know, our callbacks to go to work or go back to school or to these places, we can't forget, like we can't, somehow we have to keep this momentum going and the conversation going. And we just have to individually do like, we have to hold people accountable, our friends, our colleagues, strangers, we have to hold the world accountable. Mm -hmm. We have to do better because this is the end, like we're at our wit's end. I don't mm -hmm. know if we don't start getting results, what it would look like. Yeah. yeah. And I'll have to you know what I mean? Don't get comfortable. Don't get right. comfortable. That's uh, we, need to, we need to get out of, uh, you know, comfortable zone and, and, and do something. Um, open your eyes. Be involved in creative placemaking. This isn't just about planning and rules and regulations, but creating vibrant and thriving communities. And artists are a major, major part of that. Part of that. Yeah. That's amazing. And that's at the heart of a lot of Knight's work in community. So thank you both for joining us. I just want to um, let the audience know, this is a really amazing conversation that we just started. Our colleagues in the arts department are actually doing another show um, similar in topic on the 26th of June. So if you're getting our emails, please look out for um, arts resilience and addressing systemic change on the 26th. Um, led by our colleague Priya Sirkar. And, um, and thank you both again next week. I think we're going to delve a little bit into how, um, how various, how we do a little bit of cultural bridging, how various communities, minority groups really help each other during these times and support each other. And what are the challenges there? Because it's sometimes not as clear cut. Um, thank you all for joining us and we will see you next Tuesday. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Bye.